I work on uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So that is the carcinoma or cancer of the primary uh, hepatocytes. So it is the primary liver cancer that accounts for about 80% of all liver cancer. So um, our um, the, the all the research work that goes on in my lab is all focused on a liver um, liver function and as well as uh, liver cancer. So I'll talk um, a little bit about a few genes that we work on in this field, give you some a snapshot of the things that we are currently doing. So um, why HCC is important? Because it is the third most common cause of cancer-related death globally for both sexes. So this is really a very fatal, fatal disease. And um, the not only the uh, mortality, but the incidence of uh, HCC is also increasing very rapidly all over the world. Um, so it, it's such that the, the, the incidence is increasing so much that you can see HCC even on street signs, um, on pavements here. So these are, uh, I'm just uh, joking. Um, this is a construction company that was working in um, Richmond and they painted HCC all over. So I found it quite um, intriguing and amusing. Kidding aside, so we, um, uh, the, the HCC, the fundamental event in HCC is chronic inflammation that arises from a lot of underlying causes. For example, uh, viral hepatitis, hepatitis C or hepatitis B, um, alcoholism, uh, toxins, uh, aflatoxins and others. And one thing that is becoming very prevalent these days is uh, non-alcoholic hepatitis or fatty liver disease because of the obesity pandemic uh, that has been raging all over the world. So NASH is becoming a major cause and kind, kind of like replacing uh, hepatitis B and hepatitis C as a major cause. So when all these insults injure the liver, there is chronic inflammation and then um, this inflammation is gradually repaired by fibrosis leading to cirrhosis. And when you have chronic inflammation, there is a tug of war between cell death and uh, cell proliferation. And uh, the cell starts making mistakes, developing mutations, and ultimately develop cancer. And sometimes the chronic inflammation process is enough to induce HCC bypassing this fibrosis and cirrhosis process. So this is the current guideline of treatment. So this is the uh, Barcelona Clinic that uh, defines the HCC management. So if the disease is in its early stage, we can have liver transplantation and um, radiofrequency ablation, uh, taste and other uh, modalities. But in most cases, the patients come at an advanced stage and we have only um, the, the maximum survival benefit that we can give them is around two years, not more than that. So the current line of treatment is a combination immunotherapy. So there are two um, immunotherapic agents, for example, uh, PD-1 antibody and VEGF antibody or PD-1 antibody and uh, CTLA-4 antibody combinations. Um, and if this immunotherapy is not available, then these are broad spectrum tyrosine kinase inhibitors like sorafenib or lenvetonib that are uh, prescribed. So even with this treatment options, the combined immunotherapy gives an uh, overall response rate of about only 27%. And with the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, the uh, maximum survival benefit you can get is around six months. So definitely there is a need to better understand the mechanism of HCC development and progression and uh, whether we can develop, use that knowledge to develop new treatment. So Back in 2009, Eugene Hoshidas um, uh, published a molecular classification of HCC. So they collected HCC samples from all over the world and did um, uh, sequencing analysis. And they found out that there are three subclasses of HCC, and one of them is marked by overexpression of MYC, the driver oncogene MYC. And this particular subclass has decreased P53 there are epicam positive cancer stem cells, high AFP, and they are they have poor prognosis. So this particular subclass has uh, MYC as the driver oncogene. So MYC can be overexpressed in multiple ways uh, in different cancers. One of the ways it is overexpressed is by genomic amplification. So MYC is located in chromosome 8Q, 24.1. And 8Q is a region for hotspot of amplification for many cancers, uh, including HCC. So 
the question we were asking is that when MIC gene is amplified, um, there are a lot of other genes that are co-amplified along with MIC that resides in the long arm of chromosome 8, 8Q. So we did some bioinformatic analysis from all cancers for which the data is available, especially in TCGA, to see which are the genes that are co-amplified with MIC. So we narrowed down to five genes that are consistently co-amplified with MIC in all cancers. And this is a snapshot of HCC from TCGA. Each bar represents one HCC patient. And so you can see that in about 18% of HCC patients, we see MIC amplification. And then these five genes are co-amplified at a variable level along, along with MIC. Very interestingly, we found out that two genes, one is AEG1 or MTDH, and the other one is MDA9 or SDCBP, are overexpressed with MIC. The serendipitous thing is that um, I was part of the cloning team that cloned both of these genes as a new gene when I was a postdoc at Columbia University. And I have been studying these genes all of my life, but uh, we stumbled upon this co-amplification story much later. So I'll talk a little bit about astrocyte elevated gene one or metadrine and melanoma differentiation associated gene nine or syndican binding protein. Um, I'll talk a little bit about AG1 and mostly about MDA9 and our new studies on MDA9. So the question that we are asking in our lab is that how do genes co-amplified with MIC regulate HCC and also can they be targeted to develop a new treatment? So let me talk a little bit about AG1. So AG1 is a scaffold protein. So it interacts with other proteins and very interestingly, it also interacts with RNAs to mediate its function. So it can be a part of a large protein complex or it can mediate uh, individual protein-protein interaction. And then by that way, it mediates its function. When AG1 is overexpressed, it promotes all cancer hallmarks, uh, proliferation, migration, invasion, metastasis, angiogenesis. And it does it by interacting with a variety of different proteins um, and RNAs and uh, inducing the phenotype. So it's a 582 amino acid protein. On the N terminus, there is an unique motif called LXXLL. So this is a motif that is present in transcription coactivators. And transcription coactivators interact with uh, nuclear receptors, which are also transcription factors and mediate its function. What AG1 does is that using this motif, it interacts with nuclear receptors and competes with coactivators and prevent coactivator recruitment. And therefore it blocks nuclear receptor function. So these nuclear receptors include retinoic X receptor, RXR, retinoic acid receptor, RAR, vitamin D receptor, thyroid hormone receptor, a, a lot of uh, receptors that mediate lipid function like PPAR, LXR, et cetera. Here, it has a transmembrane domain. So that allows AEG1 to anchor on ER membrane. So this is a uh, dual immunofluorescence for AEG1 and TRAP alpha, which is an ER membrane protein showing that there is a co-localization. So when it is on ER membrane, it binds to RNA and regulate protein translation. And from there, it also activates NF-kappa B, which is a major regulator of inflammation and also RNA-induced silencing complex activation. When it is highly overexpressed in cancers, it can also go to the cell membrane and from there it promotes metastasis of uh, tumor cells. Additionally, it has multiple nuclear localization signals, so it also goes to the nucleus. And in the nucleus, it also participates again on NF-kappa B activation and uh, nuclear receptor regulation. So we have been studying AG1 for a while and we have made multiple different types of mouse models to study its function. One of them is that we made an liver-specific AG1 transgenic mouse. So we used albumin promoter to drive AG1 expression. We also had a liver-specific MIC transgenic mouse, and we crossed between them to make a double transgenic mouse. So when we induced HCC compared to the wild-type mouse, both the AG1 transgenic and the MIC transgenic develop a lot of tumors. But when we crossed them, the whole liver became tumor and these mice developed spontaneous metastasis. Over the years, we have published a number of papers uh, describing the mechanism by which AG1 works and by which this cooperation takes place. Um, so, uh, and, and these are out there. So I, I wouldn't go into detail into that. One thing that we found out that was serendipitously is that when we overexpressed AG1 in the liver, 
and allowed the mice to age, they develop features of NASH. So which is marked by accumulation of fat. These are fat lipid droplets accumulated in the liver, marked by fibrosis, alpha smooth muscle actin and collagen one are markers of fibrosis and inflammation. There is infiltration of um, F4AT positive macrophages. So we tested the reverse where we deleted AG1 from hepatocytes and we put our control floxed mouse with the hepatocyte specific conditional AG1 knockout mouse on high fat diet. And again, the control mouse developed features of NASH with accumulation of fat, fibrosis and inflammation. Whereas the when we deleted AG1 from hepatocytes, the mouse got protected. We also verified that in human patient samples where in the normal liver, AG1 is expressed at a low level, but in the NASH liver, it is expressed at a very high level, um, again, establishing the relevance. So we have done a lot of studies to understand how the underlying molecular mechanism. So I'll, I'll not go into primary data. I'll just show you the uh, scheme that we got out of it. So NASH includes two components. One is that there has to be increased fat storage. The other has to be increased inflammation. And increased fat storage could be because of increased synthesis of fat or decreased beta oxidation of fat. So we found out that AG1 through the LXX LL motif that I described earlier, preferentially inhibits PPR alpha, which is a master regulator of fatty acid beta oxidation. And by that way, it decreases fatty acid beta oxidation. As I mentioned earlier, AG1 can bind to RNAs. And we found out that it specifically binds to mRNAs that regulate um, lipid uh, synthesis especially fatty acid synthase. And by that way, it promotes de, de novo lipogenesis. And NAAG1 plays a very key role in nf B activation. By that way, it regulates inflammation. So basically, it uh, augments all steps in the NASH process. Uh, since inflammation plays a very key role in HCC development, I'll talk a little bit more about ag ones role in nf B activation. So this is the classical pathway of nf B activation, whereas TNF alpha binds to its cognate receptor, which allows the formation of this trad traf rib complex. This results to activation of I kappa B kinase, which phosphorylates I kappa beta. That results in translocation of P50, P65, NF kappa B to the nucleus, which binds to DNA and regulate transcription. So we first showed that AG1 can interact with P65, NF kappa B in the nucleus and also with CBP. So AG1 does not have any DNA binding domain but it functions as a bridging factor between nf -kappa b and the basal transcription machinery. Later on, another group shows that AG1, which resides on ER membrane, can interact with this trad traf rib complex and is necessary for the formation of this complex. And another group showed that AG1 can be phosphorylated by IKK beta, and this phosphorylation is required for subsequent phosphorylation of I kappa b by IKK beta and its degradation. So AG1 plays a is is resides in multiple steps in nf -B activation pathway and it is fundamentally required for nf -B activation. So we we looked at our liver samples. We found out that AG1 is expressed is in lot in F480 macrophages. So this is a dual color fluorescence where uh, it shows AG1 expression in hepatocytes, but if you look at the F480 positive macrophages they express a lot. And macrophages play a fundamental role in driving the chronic inflammatory process for HCC development. So we made conditional knockout mouse where we deleted AG1 from hepatocytes or from myeloid cells and induced HCC in these mice. And indeed, we found out that when we deleted it in hepatocytes, there is a decrease in tumor burden. But if we delete it in macrophages, the tumor, tumor genesis is completely um, inhibited. And this phenotype is very similar to what we see in the total AG1 knockout mouse. So we have been trying to um, test different approaches for targeting AG1. Uh, when we first started at that time, there were no small molecule inhibitors of AG1. So we partnered with Ali Asgur Salem, who is, who is an um, chair of pharmacy in the University of Iowa. So he developed an HAMM dendrimer based nanoparticle, which is targeted because it contains an uh, ligand galactose that binds to acyloglycoprotein receptors in the liver and facilitates liver specific delivery. 
So we established orthotopic xenografts in nude mice and treated these mice with nanoparticle delivering control siRNA um, or retinoic acid because as I mentioned before, AG1 inhibits retinoic acid receptor function and retinoic acid is an approved uh, anti-cancer agent. Uh, AG1 siRNA that are delivered by the nanoparticle and this combination. So retinoic acid alone did not interfere with tumor development, but knocking down age one itself could significantly inhibit tumor growth. And when we made the combination, then the tumor is almost completely gone. And this is reflected by um, the liver weight, which is an um, surrogate for tumor burden. And we also showed that when we knock down age one, we see significant decrease in age one mRNA in the tumor. So we also tested the same strategy in our NASH model where we fed black six mice high fat diet. And while the mice are on high fat diet, we treated them with our nanoparticle delivering AG1 siRNA. And indeed, we saw that in case of the control siRNA, there is development of NASH, whereas when you knock down AG1, we could protect from uh, fat accumulation, we could protect from inflammation and fibrosis, and the liver function uh, was significantly improved. And we also showed that there is a specific knockdown of AG1 in the liver, but not in other organs like spleen and small intestine. So um, this is a study that is almost 10 years old. That was the first published paper um, of a clinical trial using this nanoparticle strategy targeting two different oncogenes, VEGF and kinase and spindle protein. And I don't know if you can read, but the take home message from them is that they had complete regression of tumors in the liver. So this is a viable approach for HCC, and currently we are generating a lot of uh, in vivo data from endogenous mouse models. And our goal is to start a um, IND application to the FDA with um, ultimately starting a phase one trial using this approach. So this is something that are actively ongoing in the lab with the hope that we can start something in near future. So I'll switch gear to um, the MDA9 story. So MDA9 is also a scaffold protein, but its localization is just beneath the cell membrane. So MDA9 is important in mediating signaling from the extracellular matrix inside the cell. So one of the example is when the cells are plated on fibronectin, this leads to activation of SARC and FAC. Um, and this activation is dependent on the interaction with MDA9, and this leads to NF kappa B activation, and which turns on downstream molecules that in increases invasion, angiogenesis, EMT, etc. So, MDA9 is essential for tumor progression and metastasis. It is not required for tumor cell proliferation. And its role in other cancers have been shown, but uh, no one has studied its role in HCC. So, to check that, we um, this, this paper was, um, this work was done by postdoc Debosrimanna and the paper just came out late last year. So we made a transgenic mouse where we overexpressed MDA9 using a mouse albumin enhancer promoter. And we show that MDA9 is expressed only in hepatocytes and in liver. And so we um, first tested whether MDA9 has any driver oncogen function. So we kept this mouse for 18 months and there was only one mouse which had a very small tumor. So our what we deduced from here is that MDN itself, itself is not a strong driver oncogene. However, when we initiate a tumor, so in our lab, we use this protocol where we inject the pups with the hepatocarcinogen DN when they're two weeks old. And at six weeks, we put them on phenobarbital, which serves as a mitogen. And it takes about eight weeks um, th eight months, 32 weeks for the tumor to develop. Indeed, when we initiate the process, we see that the tumor genesis is significantly augmented um, in the transgenic mice compared to wild, wild type. And these tumors show features of HCC with in, uh, signs of liver damage. There is increase in liver en enzymes, AST and ALT. When we looked at these tumors, uh, these are tumors, so definitely they were positive for uh, PCNA, which is a marker for uh, cell proliferation, but they were also highly angiogenic. This is, they were, they stained positive for the uh, blood vessel marker CD31, and there was a lot of inflammation going on. They were highly positive for F480 macrophages. So 
um, both the inflammation and angiogenic components were augmented significantly when we overexpressed MDNI. We also looked at the immune cell pro profile in this. Um, we did an opal multiplex um, staining. And indeed, we found out that um, there is a lot more CD11B positive myeloid cells or macrophages in the transgenic mouse and also increase in FOXP3 positive T-Rex cells and GUR1 positive myeloid derived suppressor cells or MDSC. So overexpression of MDA9 in the liver creates an inflammatory and immunosuppressive environment encouraging tumors to grow. So these findings were subsequently um, confirmed by a high dimensional flow cytometry where we could isolate 16 different population of cells within the tumors. And again, we found out that the myeloid cells um, are one of the most significantly increased in the uh, transgenic tumors, um, especially um, CD11B positive cells as well as macrophages. So we asked that, okay, we overexpressed MD9 in hepatocytes. So what does MD9 does um, in these hepatocytes when it is overexpressed? So we isolated naive hepatocytes from wild type and uh, the transgenic mouse and did RNA-seq. And indeed, we found out that a number of inflammatory signaling pathways are activated. Um, NF-kappa B is activated. Integrin linked kinase signaling is activated. Um, so when ILK signal is activated, you get surrogate increase in AKT activation and ARC activation. And we know that MDA9 overexpression leads to SARC activation and also there is a decrease in E-cadherin, that is there is a switch to EMT. Uh, we did Luc Lucifer's reporter assay showing that the NF-kappa B uh, Lucifer's reporter is active much more in the MDA9 transgenic compared to wild type. And NF-kappa B regulates pro-inflammatory cytokines like TNF-alpha, IL-1, beta, IL-8, IL-6, all of them are significantly increased in our transgenic uh, hepatocytes compared to wild type. The next question that we asked is that, so we are overexpressing MDA9 in hepatocytes and we see increased macrophages in the liver, so in the tumors. So we wanted to see what happens to the non-parenchymal cells in the liver. So we removed all the hepatocytes and purified all the non-parenchymal cells in the naive liver. And then we did single cell RNA sequencing, which identified eight different clusters. We found out that in the naive condition, there was not a significant difference in the number. But when we looked at the differentially expressed genes, especially in Kaffer cells, which are the resident liver macrophages, um, and we performed ingenuity pathway analysis, we found that, that these Kaffer cells are highly active. They have increased phagocytosis and CXCR4 and GMCSF signaling, which activates these Kaffer cells are highly active. So the question that we asked next is that, okay, MDA9 is overexpressed in hepatocytes, and this leads to activation of macrophages. So what is released from these hepatocytes that leads to macrophage activation? So when we looked at our RNA-seq data, we found out that osteopontin or SPP1 is one of the top most genes that are highly induced in upon MDNN overexpression. And the osteopontin's role in angiogenesis, metastasis, inflammation are very quite well established. So indeed, we found out that the osteopontin level is increased in the transgenic mouse, both at the mRNA and protein level. This is in the condition medium. And next, we ask that which signaling pathway that are activated by MDA9 leads to osteopontin induction. And so we inhibited NF-kappa B, and we also inhibited ILK either by a small molecule inhibitor or by an ILK siRNA. And we found robust inhibition of SPP1 level when we inhibited NF-kappa B. So we then looked at the uh, osteopontin role in macrophage migration. So the way we did this experiment is that we isolated hepatocytes, knocked, out, knocked down um, osteopontin using siRNA, and then we collected the condition medium. Then we did a macrophage transfer migration assay where we put wild type macrophages on top and this condition media on the bottom. So these macrophages did not migrate in the presence of wild type condition medium, but which is significantly increased when we put condition medium from transgenic uh, hepatocytes. And this was significantly inhibited when we either knocked down SPP1 or when we blocked NF-kappa B. MDA9 also induced angiogenesis. So we use the same condition medium to 
look at tube formation by human umbilical vascular endothelial cells. So this is an um, control where we treated these hubex cells with condition medium from a mouse HCC cell RL175, which leads to nice formation of tubes. The tubes are not formed in the presence of wild type condition medium, but these tubes start forming when you put condition media from transgenic mouse, um, transgenic hepatocytes, and then uh, this is inhibited when we blocked either uh, osteopontin or SPP1 or integrin linked kinase ILK. So this is kind of our model where we overexpress MD9 in hepatocytes and that leads to activation of NF-kappa-B and ILK, which leads to form production of osteopontin that leads to macrophage migration and inflammation as well as angiogenesis leading to HCC. So I'll now show some unpublished data uh, where we are analyzing how MDNN and MIC are cooperating and how we can target those. So for this, we are using an um, approach, it's an sleeping beauty transposes combined with hydrodynamic gene delivery. Here, we clone our gene of interest in this plasmid like MDNN, uh, which has on both sides this sleeping beauty transposes recognition site. And if both these plasmids enter into a cell, the transposes uh, recognize these sequences and remove the gene of interest into and integrate into the genome. So we use an hydrodynamic gene delivery technique where we use like two milliliters of saline in which these plasmids are mixed. And then these are injected via tail vein at a very rapid rate in only five to six seconds. This creates a huge pressure on the heart. The heart stops and there is a backflow of fluid from the heart into the liver creating a stretch into the hepatocyte membrane and allowing these plasmids to enter into the liver, these, these hepatocytes. And if these plasmids encode a strong oncogene, then there will be tumor formation. It takes about five weeks. So indeed, we found out that uh, as we expected, when we overexpressed MD9, we didn't find, there was no development of tumor. MIC alone could produce some tumor, but the combination produced a lot of tumors. So um, these are ongoing studies. The booster is now doing a lot of mechanistic studies to tease out how this cooperation takes place. She's doing a lot of single cell sequencing, uh, immune analysis, and et cetera. And hopefully um, we'll wrap up the story pretty soon. So while she's doing the mechanistic studies, uh, we are also trying to see how we can target this. So Paul Fisher, with whom I have been working all my life, his lab developed a small molecule inhibitor for MDA9. So MDA9 has two PDZ domains, PDZ1 and 2, and this molecule binds to PDZ1I, uh, PDZ1 and inhibit MDA9 function, and we call it PDZ1I or PDZ1 inhibitor. So we have an MDA9 inhibitor in hand, and we have started collaborating with Sarki Abdul Qadir in Northwestern. His lab has developed a new, very specific inhibitor for MIC, uh, MIC I975, which binds to MIC and either interferes with MIC max heterodimerization, or it leads to ubiquitination of MIC and degradation. And this inhibitor also cooperates um, with anti-PD-1 therapy to enhance immunotherapy. So they published uh, two recent papers and we have been actively collaborating with him. So what we did at first is treat HCC cells with uh, PDZ1I with two different concentrations, five and 10 micromolar and MIC inhibitor with two to three micromolar, either alone or in combination. So if you look here, uh, PDC1 inhibitor alone had no effect on cell proliferation, which is expected because as I told you before, MD9 does not regulate proliferation. MIC inhibitor at two micromolar or three micromolar significantly inhibited cell proliferation. But when you make this combination, those combinations were, uh, they overlapped with the MIC inhibitor alone, indicating that the combination did not have any effect on proliferation per se. However, when we looked at matrigel invasion, which is a property of MDA9, we found out in both human HCC cells as well as mouse HCC cells, these inhibitors alone inhibited invasion and the combination inhibited invasion further. So we did a very preliminary um, in vivo study where we established uh, allograft of mouse HCC cells RAL175 in uh, black 6 mouse, and then treated them with the in each inhibitor alone or combination. 
So PDC1 I alone did not have much effect on tumor growth, but MIC inhibitor significantly inhibited tumor growth and the combination almost completely wiped out. Um, again, this is very preliminary. Uh, uh, Ali Gawi Army, who is my postdoc, is doing it in a larger cohort of mice, and he's also testing um, what is the underlying molecular mechanism, how these two inhibitors cooperate with each other. So a lot of things are going on right now in this. So um, the, the take home message from all this talk is that both AG1 and MDA9 cooperates with MIC to promote aggressive HCC. And we can combine um, either AG1 and MIC inhibitors. So this is something that is ongoing in the lab. My uh, graduate student is working on this project or MDA9 and MIC inhibitors might be potential therapeutic uh, for HCC. So hopefully, we'll have some um, uh, publications within this year uh, establishing these concepts. So I have to acknowledge the people who did all this work. So uh, before that, I want to show this cartoon. So this is a um, author list of a paper. So this is the first author who is a senior graduate student on this project, uh, made the figures. This is the second author, who is also a graduate student in the lab, but that has nothing to do with this project. He was only included because he was part of this group, and usually for the pizza that was provided. The third author is a first year student who actually did the experiments, performed the analysis, wrote the paper, and thinks being third author is fair. There are a number of middle authors whose names nobody really reads. The second to last author is an ambitious assistant professor or postdoc who started this project. And there is this last, last author who is the head honcho. Uh, maybe I've not even read the paper, but hey, he got the funding and his famous name will get the paper accepted. So this is a cartoon. This is not what we practice in our lab, so don't be alarmed. So we give credit to people where uh, the credit is due. So I must thank all the past and current members of the lab. Jyoti Srivastava and Chadia Robertson, past members of the lab, uh, did all the work with AG1 transgenic mouse and knockout mouse, and they are having a um, very flourishing career, uh, Jyoti in the academics and Chadia in the industries. Um, the MDA9 work is done by two postdocs, Debusri Manna and Aligawi Army, and uh, some of the AG1 work is being continued by a graduate student, Eva Davis. And Rachel Mendoza, who is my um, here the technician who has been with me all my life. And she's um, excellent to work with any difficult project that I have. I always throw it to her and she makes it happen. And this work could not be done with uh, the help of the collaborators with whom I've been working uh, for a long time. Another cartoon, this is the evolution of intellectual freedom. So before we go to grad school, we are we have high optimism and enthusiasm. We think about I'm going to research whatever I want. But when you become a grad student, we do research whatever our professor wants. When we are a junior assistant professor, we do research whatever our tenure committee wants. And when we are a tenured professor, we do research whatever our grant committee wants. And finally, when we research, we can do again come back to the we complete the full cycle and we can do whatever research and ultimately you can do research in peace. So yeah. I'm currently a tenured professor. So I do all the research that my grant committee at once and uh, whatever funding I get. So I have to thank the funding agencies which allow me to do my work. So thank you and I'll be happy to take any question.